Um, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to Linda Monteith Gardner. Um, Linda is a photographer, a filmmaker, and a visual artist who lives with schizoaffective disorder. She is both tortured and inspired by her illness. Prior to becoming too ill to work, she was employed in the adult education field for many years, and she was forced to leave her job due to the overwhelming nature of schizoaffective disorder. She was at a loss as to what to do with her life. Acutely suicidal, she was referred to an art therapy program called the Creative Works Studio in downtown Toronto. And she was initially reluctant to attend because she didn't believe she had an artistic talent. She soon discovered that was not the case and has led an exciting and fulfilling life since. And it was actually at Creative Works where I met Linda, so I've had the pleasure of knowing Linda for the last 10, 11 years. Um, I was working as professionally as a photographer before I went for my PhD and became a researcher and someone from Creative Works reached out looking for mentors um, to work with people in the community who were undergoing mental health rehabilitation and to teach photography. And I was connected with Linda. Um, and I can assure you over those 10 years, I've learned much more from Linda than uh, Linda has learned from me. And uh, I've, I've seen her both develop as an artist with her photography and filmmaking, and as well as, um, as a voice for patient advocacy. Um, and so Linda has presented in that role to a variety of audiences on the topic of art and its relation to, relationship to mental health, including the Conference of the American Psychiatric Association and the Canadian Association for Suicide Prevention. And her film, Valedictorian, uh, which we'll view today, I believe, is premiered in January of 2018. So she's also the author of a graphic novel about psychosis called Me at Home with My Cameras. So welcome, Linda. Nice turnout. Um, one thing, I'm just going to tell you two things. Whoops, <laughs> did I do that? Uh, I have to drink a lot of water because I'm on a lot of medication that makes my mouth very dry. So I'm not up here drinking vodka. <laughs> it just looks like it. <laughs> and sometimes, because I'm on a lot of medication, I can't find words. So if I get stuck, just yell out your suggestions, I'm sure they'll pop them up. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be standing here going, uh. <laughs> anyway, so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Martel. Uh, it's been my pleasure to work with you for the last 10, 11 years. So. Uh, what I'd like to do today is take you on my journey um, to wellness, from having a severe mental illness to discovering art. So I'm going to set the stage. I'll talk for about 20 minutes, and then um, you'll see my film called The Valedictorian, and that's another 20, 22 minutes. So um, I had a seemingly ordinary life. Um, I just do that right. Um, now, I qualify that by saying it's ordinary for somebody my age who grew up in Ontario. But I was born and raised in a small town. I went off to university, I got a degree in French because the intention was to become a French teacher. Um, that never happened because I was very sick and couldn't go. Um, and then I got married and I had two children, whoops, I'm getting behind here. And I worked <coughs> in the workplace for 20 years in management positions. So, you know, on the surface, it looked reasonably normal. and. Um, but uh, since my teen years, I'd been suffering from depression, mania, uh, psychosis, and even some PTSD. So one of the, um, one of the, um, oh, sorry, hang on here. There we go. Um, one of the hallmarks, of course, of schizoaffective disorder is psychosis. And I had been having psychotic episodes for, since I was a teen, and I'll show you one in a minute, um, one that I painted. But I didn't know what it was, and I grew up w with that attitude that only weak people need psychiatrists, and there's nothing worse than a weak person. So it never even occurred to me uh, I had psychiatric issues. Uh, but I knew something was wrong, so I went to doctor after doctor after doctor uh, trying to find out what was wrong, and not once did anybody ever say, do you want to talk to somebody? Um, and I didn't know I should, so it never happened. 
And anyway, I hid all of this from family and friends and just went got on with life. Now, just to give you an example of uh, the psychosis, like even right now as we speak, there's a camera up in that corner and there's a camera up in that corner of the room and they are watching me. And when I leave here today, I will be followed home by CSIS, as always. So it's there. I'm on a, a lot of antipsychotic medication, but it's still never at any time does it go away. Um, now, as I say, I went to doctors, didn't find anything. Finally, my husband got very um, annoyed, I guess, that I was depressed all the time, although I didn't know I was depressed. And so he called the family doctor, went to a psychiatrist, and she uh, at, um, diagnosed me with, oops, I'll get to this in a second. Um, she diagnosed me with uh, exogenous depression, but she didn't tell me. So I didn't know I was depressed. And I just worked with her for six months or so, and, um, and I got over the depression. And so I stopped seeing her. But I'm just gonna, I, I, I did this in the wrong order, so I'm just gonna show you this now. This is one, a picture of uh, one of my psychotic episodes where I believed that I knew who uh, was going to die because their skulls would turn in, or their heads rather, would turn into skulls on the street. It happened, dogs and cats, any, anything living, um, I would see these skulls and I would know because I had the special power to know who was gonna die. So that's what that represents there. Um, now, going to the diagnoses back there. So when I was 37 years old in 1992, um, I, I couldn't get up one morning and go to work anymore. I just couldn't do it. So I didn't know what to do. Like no doctor had been able to help me. So I thought about this doctor I had seen in 1987. So I called her and she saw me right away and she diagnosed major depressive disorder. Well, I was just, you know, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I had no idea that I had a mental illness and I had no idea I had depression. I mean, that sounds unbelievable to hear, I'm sure, but that was the case. And in those days, people didn't talk about it psychiatric illnesses, except as, as I said before, that they're something that are for weak people. So it never popped up in my head at all. So I had to come to terms with the fact that I had a mental illness. And that took a while. And the last thing I wanted was for anybody to know, because the stigma was so powerful and I thought I would probably lose my job. So it was a secret, nobody, I told nobody. And then in uh, 1999, my psychiatrist sent me to another psychiatrist for a consult and he said, well, you have bipolar disorder. So I thought, oh, well, that explains a few things. So when I look back at my life, I could say, oh, I must have been depressed when I did X, Y, or Z, and, or manic, uh, which would explain some of my other behaviors. But I just thought I was a bad person, I guess. And then finally, in um, 2003, I saw another psychiatrist, and he diagnosed schizoaffective disorder, which is basically bipolar with some of the symptoms of schizophrenia, which I mentioned today. Um, so even though I'm not depressed and I'm not manic, I'm still having some psychotic symptoms. So. Anyway, everything was sort of moving along nicely, uh, relatively well, until 1999, if we could go back to 1999. And that's when disaster struck. Um, and what happened in a nutshell was that when I was 16 years old, my father died and he was 46 at the time. And it was a very complicated death. He had been very depressed and but of course, we didn't talk about that. Uh, and then he ultimately died of pneumonia. Um, and as I approached the age of 46, without, of course, realizing it, uh, I was starting to sink into a very deep depression because of survivor's guilt or 
the fact that I never grieved for him properly. Um, anyway, lots of reasons. So from 1999 to 2009, um, I was just overwhelmed with suicidal ideation. And it's, in fact, I got so far as to put the hose in the tailpipe of my car and I put my hand on the ignition. But I didn't do it, and the reason I didn't do it was because my kids were still young, and I just I felt I couldn't do to them what essentially my father had done to me. So, um, however, I did begin to think about um, a, a suicide plan. I thought, well, I'll wait till the kids are a little bit older, and then I'll kill myself. So what happened was in um, early 2009, when I would have been 54, um, I set a date <coughs> for October to kill myself. And the reason I, I chose that, it was October 28, 2009, I chose that date because it wasn't anybody's birthday, it wasn't anybody's anniversary, and it was kind of after Thanksgiving, but well before Christmas, um, because my Christmases were never the same after my father died. So, um, let me just go here. <clears throat> By 2003, though, I, I'd become too ill to work. And when I stopped working, I lost my identity because I was so wrapped up in who I was professionally that I didn't exist on a personal level and um, I had no reason to li go on living. Um, I felt that I was a burden to my family and then as I say I, I set the date for August, October 2009. Now the next one, OT to the rescue. My um, I had an occupational therapist who was very tenacious and she was determined she was going to find something for me to do, something, a reason to live. So she sent me to, um, as Sarah alluded to earlier, the Creative Work Studio, uh, which is a, an arts-based uh, therapy program for people with mental illness that was initially uh, a St. Michael's um, pro program, is now being administered by the Good Shepherd. Um, so she t I went out of her hands, and this was in May of 2009, so just a few months before my scheduled departure, and uh, she put me into the hands of another occupational therapist, Isabel Friesberg, who had created this place called the Creative Work Studio. Um, I, the only reason I went, because I, as I say, I planned to kill myself, I thought, well, you know, Lorraine has tried so hard to find something for me to do, so I'll humor her and I'll go for the assessment, and, you know. So I did, and I just felt like a fish out of water. I mean, there was art everywhere, and it was beautiful, and everyone seemed so talented, and then there's me, I draw stick people, like, what am I doing here? Um, so I tried to learn to paint and draw, and I'll show you some more of my paintings in, in a minute. Um, but one, uh, I'm not sure what year it was, one year when I was in a manic state, I had bought a nice camera and I just, of course, lost interest in it almost immediately and put it in the cupboard and never used it again. But in July, so like three months after I started at the studio, <coughs> I thought, oh, maybe I'll just take a few pictures of some flowers in Hyde Park. You know, what can it hurt? So I brought in the photographs to show everyone at the studio, and I was just stunned by their reaction. You know, people called it art. And then I had to think, well, if that's art, does that make me an artist? <laughs> these, these were thoughts I was having. <laughs> um, so, oh, and merci, Monsieur Daguerre. That's me using my French degree. <laughs> I have to get uh, something out of that <laughs> so I can throw in the odd French word, <laughs> really impressive. Um, 
So, I, as I say, I, I took the, them in, and I'm going to show you some of the pictures I took that day. So that was the first picture I ever took. It's unfortunate that the green's not really showing up. It's showing up on here. So if you could see what I see, <laughs> that's very green and, and very pink. Um, and so that's another one. And interestingly, uh, that's a petunia. And the, the diamond-like things in the center are called stigma, which I thought was kind of interesting. So I uh, wrote a little note that said that um, it's, when I looked into this flower, instead of stigma, I saw diamonds. So, um, oh, keep going, hang on. Uh, so another one, another one. And another one. So I thought, gee, you know, maybe I found something I'm kind of good at. Um, people kept calling this stuff art. Uh, and so slowly I started to develop a new identity, uh, which was that of an artist. I spent my time looking for, you know, the next shot. You know, I've got to get something prettier than this. Um, the more beautiful flower. Uh, and I was so busy getting ready for um, our the Creative Work Studio show in December of that year that October 28, 2009 came and went. And I forgot. <laughs> forgot to kill myself. Didn't even notice. So um, now, besides the fact that I find creating art, a very spiritual process. Um, I was able to use art to solve some psychological problems that I was having. And one of them, and Sarah mentioned the book, this little book, Me at Home with the Cameras. The story behind this book is that I, it, it was between Christmas and New Year's, and um, I tried to find a mental health professional between Christmas and New Year's, or in August, so, when I work with uh, medical students, uh, I always say to them, is that in the curriculum? <laughs> because it just seems that, anyway, my psychiatrist goes away every August and between Christmas and New Year. So um, I thought, I was having all of these uh, psychotic thoughts and I thought it, it was becoming overwhelming. So then I got the idea, like, why don't I put it down on canvas and see if I can distance myself somewhat from uh, the, the thoughts. So I did, I, I came up with uh, 10 or 12 um, paintings and somebody said, well, put them into a book and I, I'm gonna show you some of the uh, paintings from the book. Um, so this is the uh, cover of it, Me at Home with the Cameras, and those are the voices who were telling me to kill myself and telling me lots of other nasty things. Um, this is me in the Lansdowne subway station, and the voice is telling me to jump. It was a very loud, powerful voice that every time I went into the subway would tell me to jump. <coughs> this is uh, one of a, a manic, um, uh, episode where uh, uh, this is my little red car and I was driving along the 401 I hate to say and all of a sudden all the other cars became insects so you'll be happy to know I don't drive anymore <laughs> but that was um, what happened to me and this happened to me every night on the way home from work. I would drive under a light standard and the light would go out. And it never failed, it would do that. And to me, that meant that they knew where I was and I couldn't hide from them. And lastly, um, this is me being followed. I'm always being followed. I'm never, I can't go out and go for a walk. I can go places, I can go to the store, I can go to my appointments. But I can't just go out for a walk because they're following me and it becomes too overwhelming. So anyway, um, there's one other instance of uh, using 
art for uh, psychological problems that I'll show you, and that's the film, and I'm going to show it to you in one minute. But before I do that, uh, I just wanted to show you that I now have uh, a new identity. I identify as an artist. Uh, and a whole new world has opened up. So not only did art give me uh, or save my life, in a sense, it gave me a life and a really cool one at that, I must say. <laughs> um, so I do a lot of public speaking. My, my last um, uh, speaking engagement was to the junior school of Branksome Hall. So just working with four and five year olds and talking about art and mental health, I was they're a tough crowd. <laughs> and uh, also, I just wanted to say that I still occasionally have to be hospitalized, but I haven't been in hospital now for three years. And I don't see any you know, reason why I would go back in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so last but not least, um, this is the, the second way that I used art to, to solve a psychological problem. I made a film. And I'm not going to say too much about it because it's fairly self-explanatory, but it's called The Valedictorian. You'll see why. And it's 22 <coughs> minutes long, and then after the film, uh, if there's time for questions, I would be very happy to answer. Okay. So, can you do this? Um, I just, I echo the sentiments of my colleagues in terms of like, we talk often here about the power of the human spirit, and for me that was exemplary of that. Um, I'm curious to know just a little bit of like, as you've put that out in the world, uh, be it your photography or your cinematography, what are some of the reactions that have been like maybe most powerful to you and most meaningful to you? You talked in the video about wanting to do this to make a difference in, in the lives mm -hmm. of others and open mm -hmm. up a dialogue mm -hmm. about what's a difficult conversation. Sure. Well, I'll tell you, um, we had a, a big premiere, which was lovely, of the film. The next morning I went to this, this creative work studio, as I normally do, and one of the members walked in and she said to me, you know, having seen your, your film last night, it gave me the courage to tell my doctor something I've never been able to tell him before. And that, that I just said, okay, well, my work is done here. <laughs> um, so it was, that, that I think was, is the first thing that, that, that comes to mind, was that statement, because I thought, oh, you know, then maybe I am helping people by you doing are. this. And the more I do it, the more um, things open up. It's like the universe is, just keeps opening up on me, and uh, all of these good things keep coming. So I, I know I'm on the right track. Yes. Uh, I'm just curious, as someone with a lot of friends with uh, mental conditions, how can someone best be supportive to them? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, how can like someone who's friends with them be best supportive with them? Oh, them oh, yeah. Or, well, yeah. saying, well, you have to get out to um, movies and you have to do this and you have to do that. That's not a thing to say. <laughs> I think the the thing that I loved about the studio. And, and I say it a bit in the film, is that I found my community there. So I found people who understood what I was going through and were not judgmental. And I think that's the best thing you can be to somebody who's struggling with mental illness, is just like listen to them, uh, be open to what they're saying. Um, suicide comes up, and it, if it comes up, you let it come up and let people talk about it. Um, and this is, I'm not a doctor, <laughs> but I'm just saying from my perspective, what worked was, was having that kind of non-judgmental um, support. Um, and, and so w without that kind of, I, you know, well-meaning people will say, well, you know, you must come with me to the, the, the cinema or you have to do this or you have to do that. And that doesn't help. <laughs> I mean, they're right, <laughs> but it just doesn't help. Yes. Um, thank you. That was just wonderful, and I oh, really, thank you. really enjoyed this. And um, I just wanted to get sort of your impressions or ideas about about hospitals, because you've spent some time there, and uh, thinking about how we could be doing mental health psychiatric wards differently. Right. Um, 
because this, like, the support system you found was fantastic, but it's a fairly rare situation. Yes. So. Yeah. It is. It is. Unfortunately, there should be studios everywhere, in my opinion. Um, well, it's interesting that you, you asked that because I just recently joined the PFAC um, at Sunnybrook. So uh, they're apparently going to eventually build a, a new wing, I mean, <laughs> someday. Um, but we're being asked to, get, to give our input and feedback on the kinds of decisions that they're making regarding what that will look like. So, I mean, um, that's, that's one of the, the things that, that, that I do. But I, I really, honestly, if I had $10 million, <laughs> I would just open up studios and let people come and experience the power of art. And obviously, it's not gonna work for everyone, but, but I've seen it work with, with so many people over the, the, the 10 years I've been going there. Yes. So you've been an artist, a painter, a photographer, you've done acting, you've done directing, you've done writing, you're a novelist. What's, what's the next thing you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I've been thinking about that a lot. I, I'm kind of thinking about a second film, but there's one sort of in the, on, the, on a back burner right now. Um, but I think the most important thing that I'm doing right now is advocacy work. And so I've been focusing more on that and then using my art just to b back up the things that I'm saying. So a good question though. I think we'll all be watching to see what happens <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your amazing journey. It's inspiring. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I'm glad it ended happily. <laughs> I'm glad I, I'm able to be here today. And I have to thank Sarah as well for all her help. And that's how I know I can do the photography I do because of what Sarah taught me. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.